Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and I'm here with Ben Fleischecker of Shields. You might remember Ben from our virtual ice fishing or virtual hunting series where he is the host of those seminars, but today he's going to be our guest. Today we are going to be talking turkeys. You know, it's just getting into the winter months, but now's the time to really start thinking about turkey hunting because application deadlines are going to be coming soon. So if you're planning that turkey trip or interested in turkey hunting, now's the time to start thinking about it. If you've never been turkey hunting before, it is an absolute blast. And today we're going to talk a little bit about why turkey hunting is so fun, some tips and tactics, and for you hardcore turkey hunters, we'll dive a little bit into the strategy. Ben has been turkey hunting for a long time. He's been a hunting guide, and um, we're just going to dive right into it here. So Ben, can you uh, introduce yourself and talk to us a little bit about why you enjoy turkey hunting? You betcha. Uh, hello, everyone. Ben Fleischacker. Good to see everybody again. Hopefully, the new faces out there tuning in as well. Uh, currently, right now, I sit as the SMU product developer, so I do anything Shields or Shields Outfitter branded for Shields currently right now. Been up to North Dakota for coming on three years. Um, very happy this winter was not like the last two winters, which has been fantastic for bird hunting. Uh, but yeah, so I got into turkey hunting. Uh, it's been over 20 years now, and uh, first turkey hunt was actually a late season turkey hunt in mid-May, mid to late May-ish or so back in Nebraska. I was up in the sand hills and uh, working pressured birds. We're actually hunting an outfitter place, um, a, a, a property that was outfitted on is what I should say. And man, did we get our teeth kicked in. Um, it was one of those deals that, you know, you, you grew up watching all these turkey hunting and back then it was, just, you know, VHS and DVDs and stuff like that. Uh, and the turkeys are just coming in and the toms are strutting, spitting, drumming, everything. I mean, it's just fantastic. It's not how my first turkey hunt went, but uh, I was successful that year at harvesting a turkey, which was very great. And literally ever since then, I've been hooked. Um, it's one of those challenging sports that, you know, in my opinion, you know, this may differ from some people out there, but they're the smartest, dumbest bird out there. I kind of relate them back to uh, sharp tail, grouse, rough grouse that, you know, they're not that intelligent, but they know how to survive really, really well. Um, the same thing with the turkeys. I mean, it, you're deceiving them and their eyesight, and their hearing is just incredible. Mm -hmm. Turkey, turkeys can be super deceiving, you know, like driving down the road, you see them, you know, almost run them over with your vehicle yeah. <laughs> yep. and people think, man, it can't be hard to hunt turkeys. But yep. when you actually get out there and get in their elements, it yep. is, it's quite a challenge. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's just it's the same thing with some of those birds. I mean, you put a dog down the ground, totally different behavior. Why? Because the predator prey relationship, same thing with humans. You know, I've got some of the places I've uh, been fortunate enough to hunt have been very, very, you know, necessarily pet turkeys you know uh problem turkeys is what i should say going through neighborhoods you know archery hunts stuff like that and i mean some of those turkeys i mean they're literally that stupid you know they really are i mean you can almost pet them however most situations where most of our customers most of us you know are hunting is not the case i mean these are farmland birds woodland birds um i mean you look at just across the country right now i mean you can take a look at some of the different subspecies and see you know what's easier what's not easier what's easier access what's not easier access which ones are going i call it the turkey rut you know, which ones are rutting first versus which ones rut last and kind of the regionality of those uh, and the subspecies and their behaviors on, you know, which ones are very vocal but will hang up versus ones that will come in silent on you. Uh, I think that's kind of, you start really getting to the nitty gritty, which I think, you know, just basic talk before this is that I think there's going to be some opportunity for another podcast uh, to go over some more advanced tap ticks and trips and, or excuse me, tips and tricks as well as some of the calling, but everything else. But yeah, I mean, I'm obsessed with turkeys. Um, currently at Coming into the spring of 2021, I've got 378 turkeys killed in my decoys. That's just yep. absolutely wild. Yeah, because you, you had a hashtag going last year, like yeah. race for 300. Yep, road to 400. Road to 400, that's yep. the one. Yep, I don't think it's going to happen this spring, but hopefully in the next two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, let's just talk about a little bit about the basics of turkey hunting. So for somebody that's just getting into it, what does a person need? Do You just need something to break you up. Uh, I'm a big fan of a ghillie suit personally. That's what I usually run and gun with. Um, key word is run and gun. Um, it's usually how I like to hunt. However, 
outside of the camo, I mean, a good pair of waterproof boots. Um, I usually run some mucks or some lacrosse. I'm a big fan of those. They're very comfortable. Um, and the reason why is that is usually in the early spring, it's the grass is wet. You know, uh, there's times you got to jump across a creek. There's sometimes you got to kind of wade through a little bit of a marsh, depending on your region, depending on your area. Uh, there's places in Minnesota that you have to cross a big bog to get across to the good area where they're going to be roosting at. And so in that situation, I, you know, you almost need waders at times, right? Uh, but you don't need all that. You know, you can wear your normal hunting boots. You know, if you're going to be in dry land stuff in Kansas and Texas and Oklahoma, you can get away with not having to do that. It's just comfort. Um, and depending on the turkey situation as well, I mean, if you've got, you know, of access to private property that you can drive, you know, fairly close to, that you don't have to worry about crossing everything or you don't have to worry about, you know, I've got this, you know, 3,000 acre public land piece that is beautiful, but where do I find birds at, you know, where you have to actually get off the ground and keep going and keep going and keep going. And that's where I'm running my comfortable boots. You know, I'm worried about waterproofness, but I'm more worried about the comfort. Um, and then equipment wise, I mean, any gun, you know, any legal shotgun in your area with the legal shot size, every state's different on that one. Uh, the invention of, or I shouldn't say the invention, but the, the popularity of TSS, the Tungsten Super Shot, it's a game changer. Um, we usually made it a, a point every year to try to kill at least one of our tags, personal tags, uh, with the 410 to make sure we got them in close enough. This was before TSS, and now that TSS is here, it is a total game changer. It is absolutely incredible. I don't encourage everybody to go out there and shoot with a 410. I mean, make sure you're practicing, but you 12 gauge, 20 gauge, 16 gauge, 28 gauge, it doesn't matter. Shot size is very important. Your payload is probably more important. And then ultimately your shot placement, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just like with a big game animal. Yeah. Uh, so when you're using that TSS, what sort of effective range can you be looking at there? You know, and that's, that's up to debate. Um, you know, it's one thing that, you know, ethically, if you practice, it's just like long range rifle hunt, right? I mean, um, I feel very comfortable out to 600 yards with my rifle, but somebody else may say 200 yards is their effective range. So in that situation, if 200 yards is your effective range, well, don't push it if you're not feeling comfortable. I was just talking on the phone on the way over here, actually, with a good friend, and, you know, he just bought a custom 300 wind short mag. I know this is not turkey hunt, but and he feels that his effective range is only 500 yards with that rifle. That rifle will shoot much better mm -hmm. past 500 yards. But for him, that's it. So with turkey, um, you know, usually I like to measure in feet, not yards, on where you're getting them in your decoy spread. And how you have your decoy spread will kind of also dictate, just like waterfowl, like how you have your, your spread going will show, you know, how the, those birds are going to come in and work and what they're going to work past versus what they're going to focus on. Time of year also plays a factor, too, with what the toms are doing with the hens. But, um, yeah, the TSS, I mean, it's – I would have zero hesitation stretching 40 yards. With the right choke and the right shot, you know, optics do help. And there's, you know, kind of a divided line out there of who thinks you should have optics on your shotgun versus not. I've shot – one turkey, I should say. Yep, only one turkey right now with optics on a shotgun. And it's just game changer. I mean, if I could encourage more people to do that, I think it'd be more successful. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have missed birds, essentially. Yeah. You know, if you're not down on that gun because you're sitting there and you can't move and you're really, you know, creeping up and you're not shouldered on that gun right and you're shooting three inch mag out of a 12 gauge or three and a half, you definitely get rocked and you're shooting such a tight pattern. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Do you, do you do turkeys with uh, archery equipment at all? Yep, yep. I do. Um, uh, when I used to guy quite a bit, I kind of got to the point where I was recommending not uh, body shooting the turkeys just because of lost birds. And so it got to the point where if you can't shoot them in the head, don't shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'm kind of at that point, too, with turkey hunting. Like I've, I've killed them with shotgun, killed them with bow. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's just such little margin for error when you're Very using little. archery equipment. You know, I've you know, I've unfortunately lost birds that I yep. thought was, was a really good shot and you end up can't find them because like turkeys yep. just don't bleed like it, like a deer does. <laughs> no, and know? they're tough. Like, yeah. They're, they're extremely tough. They're birds. tough birds. So yeah, I'm using archery equipment. I'm thinking I'm going to do more of the, like the decap stuff. Yep. So then it's either like you got them or you didn't. Yep. Yep. I got some good friends that are just dialed in archery shots and I've seen them make some awesome, incredible shots and it's been on film too. I mean, but I've also seen just like a Jew experience, you know. Uh, and so that's why. With archery, I love it. But if you can't shoot them in the head, I'm not a huge proponent of body shots, which just because I've seen so many turkeys run off that we've never gotten. I mean, I, it got to the point where uh, I've got a huge short hair that I use for bird hunting that I used to bring him with me mm -hmm. during the archery hunts. Just knowing that, okay, we shot this bird. All right, I'm going to go get Hans. Let's go run. Because you know, I need, because we got to track this bird. Yeah. You know. So is he actually like in the blind with you then? or We have, yeah. 
Oh, yep. that's pretty cool. Yep, I've had him in a blind. I've put a ghillie blanket over him before, just had him at heel and, you know, lay down. He just chills with me. But, yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, I don't recommend doing that. You know, and make sure your state's legal for, for having dogs and the aid of recovery as well. But, mm-hmm. yeah, when it comes down to archery, it's, uh, I love archery hunting. I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, but, yeah, shoot them in the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, ar- archery is a huge passion for me. But, you know, when it comes to turkey hunting, give me a shot. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. No, it's a ch- if you want a challenge, absolutely. Spot and stock turkeys with a ghillie suit, archery. Yeah. Oh, that, you know, that's one thing I haven't done yet. You know, I've, I've killed a few turkeys, but never, never went after them with a ghillie suit. I've done the whole, uh, you know, decoy that you crawl behind and oh, stuff. Yeah. And that, boy, that's a rush. Yep. Reaping's good. Yep. That's, oh, man, I can't remember when it first started getting big. It must have been 2000, like 2011 or so, 2010 time frame, somewhere around there. Yeah. I mean, it's a game changer. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that it does educate a lot of birds, too. Mm, yeah it's like spinning wing decoys when the waterfowl market hit i mean i remember i had the first mojo that ever came out and i i don't even know if it was i think it was robo duck actually can't think i was working with a different company at that time and man you didn't have to do nothing (laughs) nothing you didn't have a call nah you don't need a call just turn that thing on just like putting a strutter decoy out if you got hot birds put a strutter out just sit back you don't need to do any calling Mm -hmm. you know but at the same time when that bird does hang up which I know we're going to talk about. That's what separates the men from the boys or the women from the ladies. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, just a little bit more on starters and the basics, yep. decoys. Yep. Are they an absolute necessity? Um, what I would sort say of yes. decoy setups do you like to run? You know, um, t- I'd probably say more birds in my decoy spreads um, have probably died to a two or three bird setup. But early spring, um, I've, there's a, a coworker of mine, Ramsey, and him and I, I mean, we, we've gotten a little bit excessive, I think, on our decoy spread. But um, I bet you I bet you between the two of us, we can probably set a 36 bird spread with oh. the turkey decoys. <laughs> but the wild. reason why is when you got your winter flocks, yep. you know, how are you, how are you working those birds? Because in the wintertime, like if they're not fired up, it's like in the fall, just, uh, early spring, like you, it's more of a uh, connection point. Like point A is the roost, point B is their feed, and you got to get somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. You can pull them off that string. But you're not going to be calling a tom from a half mile away, you know. I mean, I've stood up on my tippy toe. I'm not tall, but taking the fan of a reaper, you know, reaper decoy, and just flag that thing like crazy from way out there, and they'll see it and they'll come in, you know. But in the early spring, I would say that's probably not going to be successful. Yeah. So in the early spring, you're doing like two or three decoys. Or early spring, depending on the situation. I mean, if I can drive to a location, like I've got the whole. It looks like a goose spread. I mean, in the back of my pickup. Um, which is, again, way too excessive. But I like to do the family groups, you know, pocket of hens, and I've got the the males, you know, whether it's Jake's or whether it's Tom's or whether it's a mixture of both. I mean, I've killed birds with two strutters and, you know, the semi-aggressive Jake and then three other Jake, like where you just have a whole group of males together, and they'll still come in. Um, But early spring, I'd recommend at least three decoys, personally. And, again, the reason why is when you're looking at your birds, the birds are going to tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. The birds aren't broken up yet, run a bigger spread. If you can't afford to run a bigger spread, just try to get closer to them with your smaller spread. You know, I can feel very confident that if I go to a brand new property that, you know, I've never scouted before, but the landowner or, or the buddy or whoever property we're hunting said, hey, you know what, they go from here to here and they're kind of milling around this area. I know I can go into that little area. I don't have to be exactly on the X, like in waterfowl. Mm-hmm. I can pull those birds with a bigger spread because it looks like a, a group of birds. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes total sense. Yep. So. Someone just getting into it on a budget, just can only buy a couple of decoys. What are you recommending? Hen and a Jake. Hen and a Jake. Yep. Yep. So are you thinking like a half strut Jake or does that matter? Yep, it does matter. Um, And your birds are going to tell you what, I mean, because I can tell you exactly what will work in whatever region we're talking about that I have personally had some experience with, but I couldn't tell you how a upstate New York bird is going to handle a decoy spread Mm because I personally never turkey hunted upstate New York or an Oregon bird or a... um, any bird, I should say. I mean, I don't need to get into the details on that one. But, yeah, for me, it would be a semi-aggressive Jake. Uh, there's a lot of great options out there. Um, you know, not to get necessarily brand names by any, any means because I don't want to upset any, any of our vendor partners. But there's a lot of good partners, a lot of good decoys out there. Um, and then the hen decoy, me specifically, it's I've kind of, I'd probably say I run probably a three-to-one ratio of three feeders to one upright hen. 
Okay. You know, or two to one ratio, two feeders to one upright. And the reason why is that feeding decoy to me shows more confidence in the spread um, for another bird coming in. Mm -hmm. Because if all their heads are popped up, I mean, you got to think about how many times have you seen all the heads pop up and then what do they do next? They're running. They're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you got, you know, those head feeders, just like a waterfowl goose spread, you know, you got a bunch of feeders out there. It looks like they're just milling around enjoying life, you know, versus a bunch of uprights. But um, if I had to pick just two decoys, it would be a semi-aggressive jake and an upright hen. Okay. And, and how are you positioning those decoys in relation to, like, where you anticipate the birds are? You know, for me, um, a lot of it goes into the time of year. Uh, because I've got, you know, I've got the strutters, I've got the semi-aggressive, I've got the three-quarter posture strutter, I've got the half posture strutter, I've got the whatever you want to call it, the, the relaxed Jake decoy, you know, and same, same type of deal. But in general, your semi-aggressive Jake is probably gonna be the most popular uh, decoy you see out there, based across like all the manufacturers out there. And then the hen decoys, the same thing with the hen, the upright hen, you know, for me, uh, just one key note before I forget, but uh, if you're first getting into it this year, I highly encourage you to buy two decoys, the upright hen and the semi-aggressive Jake. Next season, buy a feeder. The following season after that, buy another decoy. So what I've always tried to do, and I always try to coach my friends and anybody that I'm mentoring with this, uh, what turkey hunting is, you don't have to have the best spread right away. You don't have to have the best calls right away. Get good enough with what you got, and then next year add a little bit more, and then the following year add a little bit more. So it doesn't. if you got the financial means to do it, then call me up. Like, I'll tell you what you need. Like, I'm happy to tell you. Yeah, uh, It's no secret. But, yeah, um, in general, I'd probably say, depending on the area, but, you know, usually not opening weekend, I won't have, you know, I'd, it would almost be nice if we had a – let me use this. So here's my upright hen. Here's my Jake. I'll set the hen down, and I'll set the Jake right next to her. So it looks like he's getting close to, uh, to uh, making some magic happen. The reason why is I'm going for an aggressive response. Mm -hmm. I want that Tom to see that and get angry. Now, in a different situation, early season, it may be like this, where I got the hen actually stood up, like on the aggressive where I've got him almost like a semi-breeding pose, that hen is directly on the ground. Not on a stake, nothing else. The jake's on a stake. Uh, and there's decoy companies out there that make it where you can actually put the jake on top, the hen. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts, the variables that you can do is just incredible. But for me, it's more of just trying to make that flock somewhat look like a flock, you know, even if it's just two birds, you know, because on, on your calls, which we're not necessarily going to go into uh, too in depth here, but I mean, you can sound like multiple birds, mm -hmm. you know, and so if they only see two birds, but they're hearing three or four different types of hens calling, different pitches, different vocalizations, they may think that there's more birds behind them, but this is just a little party group, right? So you can kind of deceive them in that part. Um, and positioning wise, uh, depending on the shooter, depending on where we're coming at, depending on the cover, you know, I'm, even though I'm running a ghillie suit and I can get away with a lot, um, I still try to make sure you're covered. Because, again, the eyesight of a turkey, as long as they can focus in on that, those decoys, you're a little bit fine. But um, if I know they're approaching straight to me, I always try to get offset. Don't want them looking straight through you or through the decoys to see you. That's where a lot of people get hung up is that it's mm -hmm. coming, those birds are coming right at us. Well, if they're coming right at you, you cannot freaking move. Yep. You need them coming from the side so that way their, their vision isn't focused through the decoys to look at you. They're focused on the decoys, and you're still back in the cut, just hiding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, the, the one thing you really have to fool with turkeys is the eyes. And, 100%. And, um, yeah, if they're, if they're looking at the decoy spread straight on you, there's just no room for error there. Nope. But if, but if you're, you're off to the side, then you, then you get a little bit better margin yep. for error. And level of experience, too. I mean, if you got new shooters, which... You know, today, that's where probably 90% of my time, if I'm not personally turkey hunting with myself or with a family member or, or whoever it might be, um, is with new hunters. You know, whether it's a kid or whether it's an adult that wants to get into it, you know, versus if I take, um, you know, someone from here from the office, Cam, who's maybe never shot a turkey, but he shot a lot of waterfowl. I feel like I can get away with a little bit more with that mm -hmm. because he knows how to shoot. Yeah. You know, you can have your gun in your lap and still pull up and, and shoot, you know, versus a brand new shooter, like you've got, I mean, everything's got to be really good for them. You know, they need to be, that guns already need to be up on their knee. They got to be ready to pull the trigger. They got to be able to get down on that gun without a whole lot of movement versus you and I sitting there. Even if that turkey's right in front of me here to the camera, which is maybe eight feet, 10 feet, I know I can still pick up that gun and shoot mm -hmm. and hit that bird. Yeah. And that's where, you know, a ground blind really comes in. Oh, handy yeah. If you're, if you're going out with youth or inexperienced 100%. people. Yep. Huge fan of ground blinds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, location and finding birds. So what sorts of areas, if, if you don't know where you're turkey hunting, you want to find birds, where do, you, where do you go to look? You know, just like any other wild game out there, I mean, they just need a handful of things. They need food, water, shelter, right? Um, food is typically not necessarily an issue with most turkey hunting, just because you have cropland somewhere. If not, you got oak. Uh, you got something that are feeding on that you can kind of really key in on. Water, you can kind of find. The problem is, is that, you know, when you start getting to some of these northern states where everything locks up, where, where is the only place that they're going to go to find water? Some place with cattle, mm-hmm. right? And so that's going to kind of key in on that winter roost that where you're at. Uh, this isn't a bulletproof, and this isn't gospel by any means. I mean, just because you have a, um, a feedlot that's close within, you know, driving distance of a river or shooting distance of a river doesn't mean that's still going to have birds or a creek bottom or a holler or whatever else you want to think of. Um, but it's a good starting point. Why? Because, again, that, that water source is very important. Um, the next thing is, is the cover. I've seen turkeys roost in the most absolute ridiculous places. And I've seen turkeys that you've got the most glorious, you know, hardwood, whether it's a big old cottonwood, big old, big old coat or oak tree, and you look at it like, my gosh, that's got to be a roost tree. Nope, they're roosting in some little scrub brush that's only 18 feet tall versus 40 feet tall. It's the weirdest thing. Um, but for me, I always typically look for big trees, mature trees, something that gets them off the ground, they can sit on the limb comfortable, uh, something that can hold a lot of birds too. Because that early season, it kind of progresses. You know, you can have that core nuclei, which is going to be that winter roost, and then the birds start dispersing from there. Mm-hmm. You'll always have birds that stick around that winter roost, uh, which, you know, some of those birds are always fun to hunt anyways because they're usually pretty easy because everybody else is off chasing everything else now. So those birds haven't got the pressure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the dispersal, that's where usually things get fun. But to find the birds, I mean, you've got to scout. You know, whether it's word of mouth, talking to landowners, talking to the small town people, talking to family, friends, whoever it might be. Hey, where'd you see a turkey? Oh, I saw a turkey over here. Well, then you start looking at your Google Maps or, your, you know, whatever hunting application or hunting app on your phone you're using kind of look at, okay, well, that draw goes through here or that creek bottom goes through here. You can kind of start narrowing in on it, but there's literally nothing that's going to replace scouting. And I think a lot of people, um, they're willing to give up too quick on the, the hunting activity, whether it's this or any other sport, um, not sport, sorry, hunting activity. There is deer, waterfowl, upland, whatever. Um, they want the easy route. Like, just tell me where to go. Like, nah, like you got to earn it. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's, it's just more rewarding when you it's, do all the work it yourself. Is. It is. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's what sort of percentage would you say you spend scouting versus hunting? Depends on the area. So the nice thing is that turkeys are pretty, um, their habits are pretty consistent year over year. You know, I know within usually a core few miles, like this roost, you know, if I'm looking for a roost that's down in Kansas and I know I've hunted this, this roost or I've shot, I shouldn't say I've hunted, but I've had people hunted this roost for the last you know five years and no matter what within this little 10 mile square area this is somewhere where the birds are you know versus going back to a river system where you know they've got a three mile section of river but they always roost on the same half mile section year over year no matter what and so the the consistency is pretty good so the nice thing is that once you do find that winter roost you pretty much got to figure it out for the next several years you know i see it up here in north dakota where um the little area i live in i mean i'll be out in the middle of freaking nowhere I'll just randomly come across a flock of turkeys. And there's no river, no creek. It's all flat land, wooded lots here and there. But what they're using is they're using the people's houses. And somebody around there, guess what they have? Open water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Okay. So um, we have some turkey calls in front yep. of us. Can you go through what all of them are and yep. maybe your, your certain – applications for each when you'd like to use one versus another absolutely uh the first one right here um if you're new getting into turkey hunting this would be the call to get and not necessarily this brand this is a primos wet box which is a fantastic call it's a waterproof one uh, there are times that you are turkey hunting i mean unfortunately um you know we can't always hunt monday through friday and so whatever the weather gives us on saturday and sunday that's what we get those are the only two days we have to hunt so that's what we got to hunt if you go on a destination hunt I mean, I've had this happen before where you just get a blizzard or you get a rainstorm or you get a windstorm. There's just nothing you can do about it. No matter what, you always need a call, a box call. A box call is very simple to use. Um, there's many different brands out there, many different styles um, on how you want to use it. Some of them come with instructional. I mean, YouTube's out there. Uh, hopefully, maybe on the, one of the next podcasts we do on Turkey, we can kind of get into a little bit of nitty gritty about it. But if you're brand new getting into it, I highly encourage you to get a box call. Um, 
I will say you get what you pay for in most of your calls, but you don't have to buy a $100 call. You can get away with a $30 call and get away with a $15 call. Um, the nice thing about turkeys is that, they, that none of them sound the same. Mm-hmm. And I've been there where I've hunted the same property, whether, you know, I've got somebody over on this section, you know, on this back side of this canyon, I'm on this side of the canyon because we don't know which one the, the birds are going to come down. And I could have sworn I heard them call and be like, my gosh, like, that is awful. Like, we are <laughs> never going to freaking kill anything. That dude does not shut up. It's a turkey. That was making the noise. It wasn't my buddy. It was a turkey. So that's the nice thing about turkey hunting is that you can sound like garbage and still kill birds. Um, so a box call, very, very effective. Uh, slate or a pot style call. This one's a slate. That's the material we use right there. Uh, typically, you never want to put your hands on that. And the reason why is you don't want the oils on the slate. Um, but these pot calls, they come in all sorts of different materials. The wood's a different material. The actual friction material that you're using to make the noise off is a different material. This is slate. You got glass, crystal, aluminum, copper, ceramic. Um, I'm sure I'm missing something, but I'm a big fan personally of the slate. To me, it's the most realistic sounding. It's not as loud, but it's the most realistic sounding. Uh, to me, it's the same way with a, a duck call. I think a double reed duck call sounds more realistic than a single reed. Ford Chevy Dodge, people can argue that. Um, and then the glass or a crystal is usually pretty good too. It's a little bit higher pitched. The striker also makes a difference in that too. It's kind of a recipe together. Uh, and then all your other materials are nice. They've got a, uh, a place in the box for you too, like a ceramic call or a copper or aluminum. Um, I started running aluminum a couple of years ago and there's times I really like it. And there's times that, you know what, like it's not, I, and we talked about this before we started the podcast, a slate call, this material slate has killed more birds in my decoy spread for people than probably any other material. And the reason why is it's just so realistic. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you starting out with a box call and then moving to a slate when they get closer? And, you know, me, um, and this is just me again. I mean, this is just me. I do not run a box call at all. Um, I usually run two or three pot calls in my turkey vest, so I've got them in all different locations. The hardest one to get to is the loudest one because I've had times where I've blown turkeys out, and so I want to make it difficult, so i got to rethink, okay, do I really want to get this call out, really freaking scream on it, you know? And the reason why is that some birds will come in silent. You know, they may gobble off, they may their gobble again, they're getting closer, and be like, damn, they must have ran away. And all of a sudden you hear another gobble way off, like, oh man, they're way over there now, and you start cranking on it, and in the corner of your eye, you just see that freaking tom just take off. Well, that was a different tom, and that tom was still coming in. He just came in quiet. So I'm a firm believer of finesse approach. Um, I like to get aggressive at first, and then just chill out. Calm down, pull out the slate, Get a little bit quieter. You can still do it with a box call. You can still get quiet on the box call. You know, you control the, the, the noise of everything, you know, with these calls. Uh, diaphragm call is a great call, too. You can get loud on that or you can get really soft. Uh, diaphragm call is something that um, I think there's a lot of people out there that, that probably need a little bit more coaching. It's mm-hmm. a nice thing to say. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, 20-plus uh, years. Uh, for I mean... A sl- uh, excuse me, a uh, diaphragm call, which what it does is it actually goes in your mouth and sits in that little concave area, the roof of your mouth. You're blowing, you know, blowing pressure out there, blowing um, your air, your tongue position. I mean, there's so many things that are going on with that. There's some people that are very, very talented, immediately can pick up that call and just sound incredible. And you're just like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. I'm not that guy. Yeah, there's there's definitely an art to the diaphragm call. It's incredible. I mean, some people can just pick it up right away and others are just... Yep. It takes a long time. And it really you just does. Never really end up sounding quite right, and you know that's the good thing about having multiple calls. You can yeah. do slate, glass, box. Yep. You know. And yeah, I mean, there's calls that that are out there for turkey that we don't even have out as an example. But I mean, for the most popular calls, it would for sure be box call, slate call, diaphragm. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say this is beginner, intermediate, advanced. I wouldn't go that far because again, I mean, anybody can pick this stuff up. But there's so many things that go into it. You know, videos, a mentor. Mm-hmm somebody to coach you along I mean, coming into our retail stores and be like, Hey, like how in the heck do I, you know, do I use this? Well, coaching hands on, I'm the type of guy that I'm hands on, you know, like show me it once and I can do it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. show me 30 times I can do it, but like, I'm not, <laughs> I can't read something and be like, Oh yeah, that makes, I got to I'm a show dude type guy. Uh, but yeah, the diaphragm call, um, it's always good to practice. Um, I, you coming up here, I don't know, probably next month or so. Now the bird season's winding down all, I mean, every time I'm driving in the vehicle, I'll have that thing, that di- not this specific diaphragm, but I'll have diaphragm calls in my vehicle as I'm driving to work 
cranking on that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm exactly the yeah. same way. But you, know, you got to practice. <laughs> yep, you do. You do have to practice 100%. Best time to do that is just, you know, in your vehicle. Sometime you got some downtime. Yep. Like, not gonna if, get I, the if I'm blowing the turkey call in the house, my wife is not <laughs> happy with <laughs> yep. that. Uh, my my yep. little daughter will come in and be like, oh, what's going on there? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, wife, wife doesn't have the same reaction to that. Um, yep. So how about the different vocalizations, like the, the different types of of calls a turkey makes yep there's there's probably three calls that i think are going to be the most important for anybody that's getting into it one's the gobble gobble's a good thing the second one is just a hen yelp just yelping and then the other one is just stress call which is very very fast clucks why do you think all three of those gobble's good because you have it you know where that tom's coming from you know where that tom's at doesn't mean he's coming to you but you know where he's at um, and also it tells you that it's a Tom, you know, I've been that guy that, you know, I get buck fever sometimes, you know, like, you know, that 160 or 170 you saw turns into a 115 when you walk up to it, the ground shrink it. Well, the same <laughs> thing with turkeys that like, you see a turkey and they're like, oh yeah, it's gotta be a group of Toms. Well, turkeys are just big birds. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time I hunt with a good friend, TJ, and we we're back in Simpson, Nebraska on this. And we're, I mean, we were, must've been probably a mile and a half away and we're looking at the side hill. It's a big alfalfa field. And we're looking at it and he's like, man, those are turkeys. I'm like, they're freaking cows, dude. Like, those are not turkeys. <laughs> They're turkeys. You know, and then the other times, I'm like, oh, that's a tom. And, oh, it's just a hen. The other times, I see a tom, I'm like, oh, it's just a bunch of hens. And, oh, nope. So it's very deceiving. Um, but, yeah, so the, the sounds, I mean, a gobble obviously is a good thing. And, um, I mean, you can get a turkey to gobble. Like, one of my, you know, all-time favorite secrets, and it's not even a secret. I think I read about it in one of the uh, hunting magazines was, if I'm getting into a town late, like wherever I'm hunting at, and I can drive past the roost, I mean, I'll do a couple different calls to try to get them to shot gobble. That's what I'm trying to get them to do. Mm -hmm. And all I'm trying to do is just tell, tell me where you're at so I know where to set up because they typically won't roost in the exact same tree every single night. As the season regresses, they typically kind of start spreading out a little bit more in search of those hens. Um, in general, they're in the same area. But I want to know, okay, are they on that side of the creek or are they on that side of the creek or the river, ravine, or whatever else? I'll honk my horn. As stupid as it sounds, mm -hmm. I mean, if you got birds fired up, like they will shot gobble. Yeah, I, I mean, I do the same thing too. It's that, or you can do a crow call, crow, or, you know, coyote. coyote, whatever. Just something to get a reflex yep. gobble. And yeah, and even the gobble you, calls. Yeah, if if you know exactly where that bird is that night, just makes it so much easier to set up on them. Your the kill success has to go probably close to ninety percent. As long as you don't screw anything up coming in in the morning. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, if you can get a gobble when you're before you're. The night before you go in, like, it's just, it's like Christmas morning. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you so, know you're going to get some. So how close will you set up to where you think the roost is? Man, that's a tough one. Um, again, I would, I would encourage people, just like the shot distance, you know, like, what your, what's your effective shot range? You know, for me, I don't even know if I answer that, but, for me, again, getting, getting into feet, not yards. Like, mm -hmm. I want to measure that in 10 feet, 15 feet, not yards. Like, five yards sounds great, which is 15 feet-ish, but... Um, same thing with the setting up in the, the, the roost. I want to measure that in yards, if not quarter miles versus feet. Um, I have been, I'm sure other people have been in this, been in the situation too, where you're walking in, you know, to your place and you haven't, you didn't put any birds to sleep, which is pretty important if you can, if you can do it, but not always, you know, when you're driving six, seven, eight, nine hours, 15 hours to go turkey hunt. Um, and I've actually stepped on a stick and had one shot gobble right above me. And then what do you do? You know, thank God it's dark, and that's why you leave it. You know, you get in at 4.30 in the morning and sit there cold. But it's pretty nice, too, because you get to see nature wake up. But, um, I mean, I've set up right on top of them before. And other times, I mean, I know this is going to be, because they're on property, I can't hunt, but they're going to work through that property, and they're going to eventually end up on this property, and it's going to be about 9.30 to 10.30, mm -hmm. you know, when they start finally coming through. Other times, I know that, you know, they're going to be right on the edge of that boundary. They're roosting on the property I can hunt, but they always go to and travel to property i can't hunt that's when i started getting somewhat close you know and i don't know if there's a specific yard it's just the biggest thing is that they can hear you okay so just as, as long as you're within earshot you're gonna yep. be in the game anyways yep. yep don't be making don't be setting up a ground blind that close to the roost don't be going in there you know building yourself a little shelter a little blind mm -hmm. snapping twigs and everything else i know if their roost is far enough away like i'm not too concerned i mean i still come in quiet but i'm not you know, doing the whole tiptoe, you know, like you're sneaking into your house, you know, mm -hmm. on a Friday night from your parents. But, uh, yeah. So, so if a bird does catch you, 
like is is the gig up do you need to find different birds hunt or is it possible to still kill that bird that morning still possible because they don't know what it is mm -hmm. as long as you're not talking as long as i mean I, I mean even hearing deer like spooking out deer walking in before and it sounds like a train wreck you know like a bull moose going through the woods and you still can kill birds you know they don't know what's going on as long as they can't see as long as it's dark you're good. yeah but yeah if they see you just leave because mm -hmm. all you're gonna do is educate them yeah makes sense yeah so when you're when you're first set up what sort of uh what sort of calling cadence are you doing are you, are you yelping are you super aggressive right away to get them fired up or it really depends i mean i like to let them kind of wake up a little bit um because they're going to be in the trees and they talk and talk and talk and you got the hens talking and you got the jakes and toms talking and they'll get some gobbles coming up too and um you know, for me, it's as soon as I start seeing birds fly down, I'll start calling a little bit. And the only thing I'm doing is just, hey, there's something over here. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. getting aggressive until they're all on the ground. Then it's totally different. You know, and it's one of those deals that, you know, how do you want to shoot a big buck during the rut? We got to find the does, right? Same thing with, with turkey hunting. You need to find the hens to get your toms. Just because those hens don't have a tom doesn't mean there's not a tom somewhere coming. Because yeah. they heard those hens screaming in the tree, you know, 20 minutes ago. But what I try to do is, if you got a big group of birds and you're not, and they're not necessarily wanting to come your way, is my entire focus turns to the hens. I try to get that boss hen all fired up and wanting to come in and fight my decoy. You know, I want her coming in strutting, which is pretty cool to see. Have her come in strutting. That will also, in turn, bring in the tom. Okay, so that's going to be your strategy when hunting big flocks is you want to bring the hen in. You're I'm not... getting the boss hen. Okay. I don't mess. I don't. I don't care one bit about the bull, about the the, the boys, at all. I'm calling in the girls, cause guess who comes? Guess yep. whose milkshake brings in the boys? <laughs> that hen, that boss hen's gonna come in. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, again, it, I mean, it sounds easy. It takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm, it does, and I mean, every turkey's different yep. too. You know, yep. you can you can have success one way and try the exact same thing and fail miserably. So yep. it's. Uh, it's really all about reading the birds and, and what their attitudes are at that point in time. Yep. And if for the brand new person going out this first time this spring, which I encourage hopefully everybody going out, I mean, just stay away from my areas. But uh, <laughs> yeah, pick up that box call. And obviously the day of your hunt, do not have that be the first time you've used that, even the day before your hunt. I mean, we had talked about a little bit ago with the diaphragm call, practice. Mm -hmm. Like I'll have my slate calls with me. I'll have my glass calls. I'll have my aluminum call. I'll have my, I'll have everything laid out. I mean, it's all like how I put it away at the end of the season is everything's been reconditioned. Everything's ready to rock and roll that if I had to pick that up today, that everything's ready to roll go. I don't have to worry about reconditioning anything, my tips, the, the tone boards, anything, the chalking. I still have box calls for brand new hunters. Like, hey, I'm going to use this. Uh, I like the Woodhaven calls personally on the box call. And so I've got a Woodhaven that I, I give whoever I'm hunting with. Uh, it was a brand new hunter. Why? Because, man, they're just so easy to use. You know, you can just make some, some, some really soft, you know, yelps on that. And that's what the first person going out there on the opening morning of their turkey hunt, never turkey on a day in their life. You got makeshift camo that probably doesn't match, you know, whatever shoes you're wearing or boots, whatever camo face covering is very, very important. Your hands and your face, uh, you can do face paint. I mean, I personally never done face paint, but I know people do. I just use a mask, uh, or a hat that has built in mask on it. Or on the ghillie suit, you can also pull that over. It's got a mask usually too, but yeah, um, the yelping, just very simple yelps of them, you know, and again, you're not, you're not advanced enough to really know what they're saying. And I'm not even saying I do. I mean, after 300 some turkeys, like I still get schooled every single year, mm -hmm. like every single year I get schooled by birds. Um, and that's what makes it so addicting is that you can never be the best. There's always that one bird that for whatever reason, never got shot. Um, but yeah, soft yelps. You can do some clucks on that too. You can do some purrs. I mean, you can do everything. But for the most part, it's just yelps. Just okay. yelp, 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 yelp. Get them looking, looking. Okay, yelp, yelp. Okay, looking. Yelp, 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 yelp. Okay, they're kind of working off that way. No big deal. Yelp, yelp, yelp. Eventually, they're going to come in and investigate. The problem, I think, with a lot of people is they give up too early. Like, I'm a very, very impatient person. I cannot tell you how many times, like, okay, I'm just going to give it five more minutes. You know, and then, okay, I'm going to give it like 30 seconds. Okay, well, no, I think I just heard something. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes. And then you're like, ah, screw it. You know what? I'm done. Start, you know, picking all your stuff up, you know, because I've got like a whole array of, you know, I've got a 20 ounce of Coke right here, and I got my pot calls all laid out, and, you know, shotgun across the lap if I'm hunting. Um, yeah. 
and you get up, and guess what's behind you? Or guess what's just right in front of you that you never freaking saw? I cannot tell you how many times I've been just, I just would have waited. And so that's the thing is that get their attention, let them know you're around. Eventually, they're going to come investigate. Mm -hmm. Keep yelping because if that Tom comes and he's chasing those hands and those hands are like, nope, I'm good, that Tom's going to break off and he's going to start looking for an active hand or a hot hand. And that's where that yelping is really going to play a factor. Okay. So what is your advice on, uh, on turkeys that get hung up just out of range? There's a few things. If they got hung up because they saw you, you just cannot move. And you just hope that you have some decoy movement. That's another key thing that um, I think a lot of people overlook is their decoys, you know, and that's one thing that eventually everybody's going to come across is that turkey that gets hung up. You know, why did that turkey hung up? Why did that turkey not commit? Like, I wasn't moving, I wasn't doing anything, but it's hung up at 65, 70 yards. You know, and that's the nice thing about some of those, you know, um, the TSS and, you know, I mean, there's blindside. That's sorry, not blindside. What am I thinking of? Uh, Longbeard XR from Winchester. That's a great lead round. I've shot a lot of turkeys with that. Seen a lot of turkeys die with that. Um, but it gets down to can you effectively or efficiently kill that turkey at 65 yards? I mean, you have to have the right choke set up. And that's where optics on a shotgun are so fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, the game changer of making those long range shots with a person that hasn't been out there shooting, you know, every weekend or practicing or anything else like that. But with that hung up bird, um, a few tricks I do is I'll get really aggressive and I'll just shut up. You know, cluck, 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 yelp, 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 cluck, cluck, yelp, 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 and I just shut up. And just see how that Tom responds. Usually what will happen is they just, out of just pure will of their, you know, instincts, is they'll fluff right up. Mm -hmm. They'll strut right up and they'll kind of go to a three-quarter strut and just kind of be looking around. And what's happening is those decoys are not moving. And so I can't even tell you, it must have been probably I mean, mid-2000, mid-2000 teens, like 2015, 16, somewhere around there, Dave Smith decoys. They came out with a, um, an attachment point to a hen, or a, a root, sorry, not rooster, uh, a Jake decoy for a breeding partner that you can actually put on them and you can pull it. It's kind of like a jerk cord for, for waterfowl hunting. Mm -hmm. We were doing that 20 years ago, you know. It's just, it stinks that everybody comes up with these things, you know, these top secrets that we had, you know, that, that separated the men from the boys or the, the women from the girls, you know. Uh, but the movement of the decoys, when that turkey hung, hung up, guess what? I got that little, you know, my little ghetto setup that I had back then. I just start twitching it. Just get that thing moving a little bit. You know, and now they make a, oh, I can't think of it. I've got one. It's something 360. Anyways, it's a motorized base. You can put four screws on it, put your, um, your um, stake into it, and actually will spin the decoy for you. That thing is a game changer. That's how, the new mojo. So how often do you use that movement? For movement, depending, um, I'd probably say probably 70, 75% of the time. Hmm. I'll give some jerks. I'll, and one thing I've done too, and I don't recommend this all the time, uh, but I'll throw stuff in my decoys just to get them to move. Okay. You know, if the bird's far enough away, like, all I'm looking for is just those decoys. Just change the, po the posture. Change how the sunlight's hitting that decoy. And just give it a different shine. You know, because we were talking about reaping earlier before this, and, and that's something that um, I caution everybody with reaping decoys. There's a lot of people that get shot every single year because of reaping, because it looks so realistic. Uh, so when you're reaping, make sure you're not reaping someone else's decoy and you're going to get shot. Or even thinking about it on public land. Um, reaping is very, very successful if done right. Uh, it's definitely a game changer, and it definitely can accelerate somebody's success in the turkey woods with reaping because you don't have to be a good caller. You don't have to have the best camouflage. All they're doing is they're focusing on that decoy. I reap. I've done it. Um, we've killed a lot of birds reaping. Nothing against it. It's just I just caution everybody because it's a matter of time. It's not, it's not what if, it's when in that mm -hmm. situation where something potentially could go wrong. But on that hung up Tom, I mean, it's movement. It's just trying to get something different. Um, and the ghillie suit, that's why I like running ghillie suit because when I'm guiding, I, I, can keep, I can keep you right. Hey, just stay right there, Mike. I'm going to kind of creep out there a little bit. I'm going to take this decoy. I'm just going to twitch it a little bit or I'm going to move it around a little bit or I'm going to take that strutter decoy that's back behind me that I'm not using yet. I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that out for it. Then you have a Tom that hangs up at 75 yards and you have not done anything wrong. But why is that Tom hung up? But then you can go next weekend and go out and catch that, just like fish, right? Mm -hmm. Why can that, that little hump be so productive today? 
you go back tomorrow and it's a wasteland just wild animals right yep yeah mm -hmm. nothing nothing's for certain in the turkey yeah. woods no but yeah on those hung up toms uh i would encourage you for a you know not point fingers but man stop moving mm -hmm. like their eyesight is so incredible and usually it's because they see something they don't like it could be that coke bottle i have they could see that coke bottle even though the day before you just saw them strutting around a junk pile like why all of a sudden this coke bottle makes a difference you know um it's just we get we think we're sneakier than we are at the end of the day but again like that's what i watch why i like ghillie suits because i can get away like i don't sit still i mean obviously right now i'm not sitting still but uh i love ghillie suits we can get away with a lot mm -hmm. just because it breaks up your outline so 100 percent, 100 percent. you know you, there is no outline mm -hmm. there's kind of a blob you know yeah ghillie yeah. suits are just i use them for deer hunting i use them for turkey hunting used to use them for waterfowl hunting sitting on the bank mm -hmm. so you touched on um you know, a trophy you is really those one with big spurs. Yep. You know, how do how do you target those older boss gobblers? Do you do things differently? No, I wouldn't say I do anything different. Um, and uh, it's all regionally based too. I mean, I can go to an area that you know has not been turkey hunted for 15 years, and these birds have got to just be dumber than snot. And these birds got to be old boys, inch, inch and a half, inch and three quarters. You know, pushing that two inch mark and. Uh, but to this date, out of you know the 378 turkeys, um, I've yet to see over anything over two inches uh, for a spur. I people shoot them every year, so they exist, you know. But it's one of those unicorns for me. Mm -hmm. But um, on those old birds, I mean, you know, with the preseason scouting, uh, the beer does give you a good indicator. But if beer rot went through, I, there's certain places that I've uh, I've been in Iowa before that the beer rot's just so bad that you have no idea the age of the bird. You know, it could be a Jake, it could be a seven-year-old Tom, you know, and so the binoculars is really good. But if you know you got an area with a big mature bird, you know, and again, like we always get so focused on those beards, which is a good indicator of maturity. The tail fan's the best way, you know, if it's a full fan, whether it's a partial full fan or whatever it might be. Uh, usually with them, they're the boss. But sometimes, and, you know, this is up for debate too, you know, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, but uh, a passive-aggressive Tom. Uh, to me personally, it's most most difficult bird to shoot. The birds that do not react one bit to any sort of a male decoy, like whether it's a Jake decoy, whether it's a strutter decoy, whether it's whatever kind of posture you want to use, they just, they're sub, they're sub, they're not aggressive enough. They'll gobble their freaking heads off and they'll hang around hens and they'll come in and check out hens and do all that. I mean, I've killed some of those birds, but just a strictly hen decoy spread. And so when you're going into a spot, not knowing what to experience or expect, I should say, don't just run a hen decoy spread. Like you still want a male, you still want that aggression, you want that response, you know. But then some of those birds, um, the older birds, they've survived for so long because they're not aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, that's definitely one of those hunts that you're not gonna just figure out one day, or that one bird. You know, there's a bird that's uh, back in my hometown that my cousin and I probably, geez, this bird's gotta be over five years old now at least, because I think we've been chasing him for four years and we cannot get this bird killed. How do you know it's the same bird? Same area. Okay. He's in the exact same spot. We, we have permission on this property too. Um, this is the exact same spot every single year. Every single year, he's this lone tom with two hens. Every single year. We cannot get this bird shot. I mean, we can get him shot if we really wanted to, but we want to make sure that we're not just going to ambush him. You know, like we talked about mm -hmm. you know, early on turkey hunting. It's, I shot a bird, you know, well, did you shoot him in a decoy? No, like he was running like 5,000 miles an hour, and I just let him and shot him, you know. Not everything's going to be picture perfect like TV wise, but yeah, we can kill this bird. Hopefully this, this spring, he's definitely got a big target because he's, he's got to be pushing six, seven years old. I mean, and if it, he survived. It, have you seen him this winter? No, nah, I haven't even been down there. Mm -hmm. so, I don't even know where his winter roost is, to be honest with you. He just okay. shows up and eventually once he shows up in this property and it's, it's right next to a river and it's probably, a, it's a full mile section, so 640 acres, but he just lives in like a 40 acre area mm -hmm. for the most part. Is, is there anything different you're going to be doing this year compared to years past? For him? Yep, for him. Single hand decoy. Single hand decoy. Yep. Single hand decoy and not even calling. Hmm. 
I don't, I, so man, we've thrown everything at this turkey, <laughs> literally everything. I mean, we've, and we've had opportunities to kill him, but again, like we want to give him the respect that we want to shoot him in the decoys. Yeah. Right? You know, it's, it's one of those deals. That, I mean, you can look at anything like your archery hunting, you know, I want to shoot this deer exactly how I want to shoot it because I respect him enough because he's schooled me so many times, you know, same thing. Mm-hmm. It's not about the kill. It's about the, the actual hunt. Yeah. But it's about the experience. Yep. And then, you know, that's, what's just so great about turkey hunting. Oh yeah. You know, like you sit cooped up all winter and, and <laughs> yep. finally, you know, finally gets warm out and just being able to be out there, experience the, like all the new growth and, mm-hmm. you know, it's feel green the sun on you. <laughs> it's just, it. It's it's such an awesome experience, and Without that's that's one of the first things that that really turned me on to turkey hunting because you know I, I grew up in an area that didn't really have a lot of turkeys. I didn't know a lot about turkey hunting. Saw it on TV and I was like, well, I don't know if it's really for me. But then you know, moved to North Dakota and I you know I was in an area that you know it's easy to get a tag. You know, it's every other year you're generally drawn. And uh, so I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. And, um, you know, that just that first year, I was, I was absolutely hooked. Yep. It's just, it's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of even hard to describe. It's just something you got to get out there. You got to try it. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're tired of being cooped up all winter, you want to get outside, you want to do something fun. Turkey hunting's the thing to do. It, it can be. Yeah. I highly encourage it. I mean, again, don't, don't hunt anywhere where we're hunting, but <laughs> highly encourage you to get out in the spring woods. I mean, there's something like, I, I just, I live for, for April. I mean, just absolutely love April. You know, you got walleye, you got morel mushrooms, you got Turkey. I mean, it's just like, uh, just love it. Mm-hmm. You know, Can't forget the shed hunting too. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Keep your deer. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, even with just the experiences you get to see, you know, I mean, it's, um, you know, watching nature wake up, wake up. I mentioned earlier, you know, and it's you know, having, uh, coyotes, having bobcats, having fox, having a uh, random, you know, farm dog, just showing up in your decoy spray, you know, having cattle come through, having deer, you know, that's one thing that, um, the deer, the deer and turkey relationship that they have is absolutely freaking incredible. If you haven't experienced that to see them interact with each other, like they feed off each other. It's incredible. Like if a turkey gets spooked. The deer gets spooked. The deer gets spooked. The turkey gets spooked. They may not, you know, either one of the species may not just disappear like the other one did, but they know something's up. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, that's one thing. If you got deer in your area where you're turkey hunting, man, try to spook all those freaking bastards out. It's freaking deer <laughs> ruining the turkey hunts. But yeah, I mean, yeah, those- I've oh man, I've had more than one deer ruin my turkey hunt. You know, <laughs> like I just have the perfect setup. I'm in this little corner. I know the turkeys are gonna come filter right through me to roost. And then all of a sudden, just a big old doe comes walking into the setup, sniffing my decoy, stomping. Blowing. Like, then it's, it's just game over there. Like, yeah, that's, that's just something you can't really account oh, for. Either. No, you can't. That's you know, why you, you have <laughs> rocks and sticks and mud and scare that freaking deer away from you. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't done that before, but I'm going to, oh, yeah. you know, from now on, I'm going to, you know, when I sit down, I'm going to get myself a big old dirt cloth <laughs> yep. just in case I got to get the decoy to move. To, yep to scare a deer off so yep. that's you know that's one thing i'm definitely going to take away from this podcast good, is good. i'm going to have a dirt cloth in my <laughs> setup every time <laughs> so yeah. um you know before i let you go i, I got to hear about that turkey recipe yeah so um what i've done and this is a modified recipe and i'm sure it's actually out there as well but uh it's bacon turkey breast and it's very important that you keep the turkey legs um I can't tell you for the longest time, even with pheasants, you know, with some of the game bird species, you know, like a quail or a chucker or a grouse, a uh, sharp, sorry, a rough grouse. Like I will keep the actual legs, you know, because they're pretty tender. Uh, pheasant, the drummy gets a little tendony just because they run so much. Uh, same thing with the turkeys, you know, the turkey tendons on their drummy is really bad. Um, and so you can actually scrape some of that meat off. But the biggest thing is with this recipe, you need that dark meat mm-hmm. to help offset the white meat that's so dry and lean. And then you got the bacon anyways, so you got your mixtures like one pound of bacon. I do one pa- one package of bacon per bird. You can do two packages of bacon per bird if you want. You grind it all up. Again, you have to have that dark meat in there. And man, you make turkey burgers. You can put like different chunk like the feta cheese in your burger too. Mix that all in there. You throw it on the grill and it's so good. Ooh, that- it's really really good. I mean, I there's a lot of good recipes. I mean, you can throw it on the grill. You can cube it up, marinate it, wrap it up like dove. You know, dove mm-hmm. breast or teal breast like that. Jalapeno in there or something, but. Uh, those turkey burgers because then you can take it you can make pasta out of it you can make a meatloaf out of it you can make 
whatever you want. Anything you use grinds for, you can use it for. Mm -hmm. But Very yeah, it's nice. really good. And it, it's incredible how good it is. But again, you, the biggest, biggest problem with that is you have to have the dark meat. Okay. So mm. don't forget the dark meat. Interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I actually just started saving the turkey legs too. I was, uh, I was scrolling through Instagram. I saw something from Bomar Bow Hunting. They did, a, they did a pulled turkey legs. Mm. And that was, that was pretty delicious. I mean, you, brining is the key though. Yep. You know, they, you like the birds, uh, they're, they are gamey if you don't prepare yep. them right. You know, but, it's you, know you, you, you put them in a brine, salt brine, buttermilk brine, whatever you mm -hmm. want to do. Make sure you brine it, but yeah, we, we toss them in the crock pot and you know until basically they fell apart, and uh, and that was delicious. <laughs> um, my wife does a really good job uh, using the pellet grill and doing nice. doing bacon wrap turkey Ooh. too. Yep. You put uh, get some jalapeno cream cheese in yep. there and then wrap it in bacon and yep. then throw it on your pellet grill. Oh yeah, oh that is delicious too. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, it's it, gets, really good. it just gets me excited for turkey season just to be able to eat them again. You know? Yeah, I know. I wish we, wouldn't, we didn't have this podcast <laughs> going on in January. It's going to be a long wait. I mean, Florida does kick off here coming up. And, I mean, you even mentioned, too, that, you know, tags or, or applications are coming up and everything else. And depending on the state you live in, some states are over the counter. And, you know, who knows what 21 is going to look like this year with COVID, mm -hmm. uh, with travel restrictions. I know certain states completely shut down mm -hmm. all their non-resident tags. Uh, other states were asking for you to turn them in and they give you a refund. Um, so hopefully this spring things are back to normal and people can start traveling. Cause I know I, we cannot be the only ones right now, just drooling at the mouths, just waiting for turkey season. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, I got to make sure to check those regulations and see when, uh, when your turkey applications are due because it is, it's a lot of fun. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so exciting. I mean, I've got so many videos on my phone. I mean, you can look at YouTube for anything else, but I mean, just having that tom come in, it, whether even if it's just a hen, you've never experienced it. I mean, I took a gal, um, um, this was six years ago, maybe or so. Um, this is when I was working for a different company and she flew in for a bunch of meetings and she's a diehard hunter and she's one of the gals that, um, she came in for a different meeting. This was previous and she's like, hey, I wanna go shoot an antelope. I have three hours. I'm like, let's freaking roll, let's go. <laughs> Uh, her name's Karen. She's fantastic. Karen Butler. She runs uh, Shoot Like a Girl. Fantastic woman. But uh, anyways, for turkey hunting, I mean, she had turkeys literally right on top of her. Unfortunately, no toms. But anyways, I mean, that experience for her, like, it's just incredible. Oh, yeah. That's you know? enough to get you hooked right there. Oh, you yeah. don't necessarily have to pull the trigger, but to, to be able to experience like that, just get so close to a wild animal. Yep. I mean, enough to grab them. Yeah. <laughs> spitting and drumming. And that's one thing, like, what is this spitting and drumming people always talk about? And this is way back in my early days. And I'm like, whatever. And then all of a sudden you hear it and you're like, that was a spit and a drum. Don't move, <laughs> you know, because you can hear them and like you can feel them drum like you think you're having a heart attack because you can just feel it in your chest and doop, 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 doop. you're like, what the, what's going on? It's yeah, a it's, a, I mean, it, there's no way you could describe it. It's just, no. it's something you got to be out there to hear it, experience yeah. it firsthand. Yeah. And you don't, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I work birds. I don't shoot, you know, like I just want to work birds. I mean, I'm that weirdo that you're driving down the road. I'm like, what is that dude doing out there? Like he's, doesn't even have a shotgun, but where's his decoys? Like, he's got all these, I just like working birds. Like, I just absolutely love turkeys. Mm -hmm. Like, they're so much fun. They're so animated. They're, I mean, there's times that you can be a hero, and then they go to the next field, and you're mm -hmm. absolute zero. You know, <laughs> and it's just because of whatever the turkeys decide to do that day, you know. And, I mean, there's times that I've shot turkeys in a white T-shirt. Like, you're just driving down the road, and, you know, like, oh, there's birds out there. You just run out, grab your decoys, and you just sit there. As long as you're not freaking moving, you know, it's pretty amazing what you can get away with. Very cool. Yeah. So, you know what? Thank you so much for yeah. your time, all your insight. I mean, you have me just chomping at the bit <laughs> to get out turkey hunting again. Yeah, so I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. So I appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for all of you that have tuned in, hopefully you uh, hopefully you enjoyed this segment. Hopefully you learned something. If you're, you know, if you've never been turkey hunting, hopefully this uh, got the gave you the itch to try it sometime. So. Make sure to check your your application deadlines. Get those get those applications in, and and hopefully you can get out there in the field. So if you enjoyed this segment, please uh, give us a follow on the listening platform you chose today. And with that, we want to thank you for listening, and see you next time. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.